what you're <laughs> teaching people is an intuition technology. Right. So to tap into information that they will see at a time in the future, right. to tap into the the winning score of the Super Bowl, or it, not something like the actual score, but over under. In fact, over, we under. did. We yes. did over under yes. on the Super Bowl got a hit. The viewers learn about their own consciousness. The viewers learn that they can gather information from the future. Wow. You can do what? It's intuitive and the way you said it was beautiful. You step into it in the now um, and it'll manifest in the future. Um, yeah, no, that was, that was, that was beautiful. Everyone, welcome to another episode of Unpacking Possibility. I'm your host, Tracy Stein. As always, I'm so happy to be here with you. This episode is part two of my interview with Marty Rosenblatt. Now, if you remember, last episode was part one, and Marty is a physicist. He's the co-founder of the Applied Precognition Project. Last time we spoke about healing and remote influencing your own health. In this episode, we talk about remote viewing and specifically associative remote viewing and group associative remote viewing. Now, if you're not familiar with those terms, I explain a little more later in the episode. And if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll be able to see real examples of remote viewing, what the process looks like, an example of a session by a completely new remote viewer their first time. It happens to be my husband who really didn't want to go to this remote viewing conference years ago. I made him go as partners often do. But the long and short of it is his remote viewing session was uncannily accurate. And I show you his sketch, the possible targets. We actually wagered on what he came up with and won. So if that sounds intriguing to you, stay tuned. And without further ado, on to the episode with Marty Rosenblatt. Let me talk a little bit about remote. Viewing. Please do. Please do. Because So this might be a good time just to go over some of the basic terminology that Marty's going to describe in case remote viewing is something that's newer to you. So first, remote viewing is a type of intuitive or psychic technology. It's a discipline. It's a very structured way of working. And it was developed in the early 1970s at Stanford Research Institute in conjunction with U.S. military intelligence. It's actually a really wonderful way of getting very specific information and even drawings about something um, and cuts down on the amount of mental noise somebody might have when they're trying to tap into something psychically. Now, Marty uses terms like the tasker. The tasker is the person who is going to give you the assignment, the thing you're going to tap into. Usually the tasker knows what it is they want you to learn more about or, or tune into, but you, the remote viewer, won't. You will be blind to what the actual target is. So that, again, cuts down on mental noise of our own preconceptions and so forth. What is given to the remote viewer usually is a coordinate. And Marty mentions that. And a coordinate can just be any series of numbers or numbers and letters that are used as a stand-in for the target. Nobody knows why you can just randomly assign any group of numbers or numbers and letters to something. And somehow that makes it easier for your consciousness to connect to that thing and gain information about it. No one knows why, but it works. And it's been tested again and again and again. Marty also talks at some point about the analyst. That's the person who's going to have whatever you've written down, your transcript of what you found when you try to tap into something, all of the descriptors, the things you've noticed, the things you've drawn and written down, that's the person, the analyst is the person who is going to say how closely what you came up with resembles 
the actual information, the outcome, so forth, whatever it is somebody wanted to know about the target. Marnie, can you just explain what associative remote viewing is for people who may not be as familiar? Yeah, yeah, okay. Remote viewing is the ability, someone gives you a a, a tasking. Usually it's just six digits or words or something. They don't tell you specifically what it is, um, but they know what it is. And, well, let's just start there. And then... um, you get quiet, you meditate, you then generate a transcript based on those six coordinates. They will then afterwards give you feedback. So let's make it really simple and say it's a photograph. You will then see the photograph, which you can then compare to your transcript. When this was started at Stanford Research Institute, they would actually go out to a physical site. So they would give them a coordinate and um, they'd be told that they would then be taken out to the site afterwards. So they didn't know what it was. They had a hundred random envelopes and they would choose one. Well, people like Russ Targ, Pat Price, a few others were really good at this. And when they would go out to the site, you know, they could say, oh, yeah, I drew that. I drew that. Yeah, I saw this. I forgot to draw this, but I saw it. So they would do a detailed feedback. Now, that's classical remote viewing. Precognitive remote viewing is nobody even knows what the picture will be. The picture is drawn, and it could be a physical site you go to after the transcript is in hand. So you could see how that would be precognitive. The tasker, who gets the number, and the remote viewer are both blind to this. The viewer does his transcript, and then they randomly choose a target, and they did this. And then they would go out and see the target. Pat Price did this because he got bored waiting for the time when they were going to take him out. He says, I'm bored. I want to do it now. That was how the first precognitive remote viewing at Stanford Research. If you didn't quite catch what Marty was referring to here, that's completely okay. The outbounder experiments were something started at Stanford Research Institute again in the early 1970s, and they were a super interesting way of testing the limits of remote viewing and what people could actually tune into and tap into and learn more about psychically. Now, The initial remote viewing experiments often had a a photograph of something or someplace in an envelope, and the task would be to view the photo that was in the envelope or to view the location or the thing that was depicted on the photo in the envelope, right? But of course, no one knew what was in the envelope until after the viewing was done. The outbounder experiments were different because the thing, the target that remote viewers were supposed to tap into was actually a location that was randomly picked and that neither the viewer nor the tasker knew what it was. But an outbounder was another person who would go to that location. Again, the location would be randomly selected. There would be a myriad of envelopes, as Marty mentioned, and each one contained a um, a location that someone might be tasked with going to. The outbounder might be tasked with going to. And you, the remote viewer, would be tuning in at Stanford Research Institute to wherever this person had gone. And you would be tapping into what they were seeing, what they were feeling, what they were smelling, what the temperature was, and so forth. And as with the other remote viewing experiments, they were uncannily accurate. Now, The interesting thing about these outbounder experiments is that initially the experiment involved someone randomly picking an envelope, handing it to the outbounder. That person would go to that location. It could be anywhere in the world, so it might take some time for them to get there, and then the remote viewer would tune into it. Pat Price would get bored waiting for that person to actually physically go to that location 
And what he would do is sit and tune in to where the person would be going before the location had even been selected. That is possible, and that is the precognitive element of remote viewing. So it's not just tapping into something that already is going on now or has already happened, but something that hasn't even been determined yet. So it's precognitive, it's tapping into a future event, and that is just as possible as tapping into something that's already happened. So I think that's interesting, and I hope you do too. Back to the episode. Associative remote viewing has two possible targets. One target might be associated, say, with the stock market moving up. The other target is with the stock market moving down. Now, this is important. I haven't brought the analysts in yet, and it's critical in associative remote viewing. You know, this is simpler to do than it is to talk about. But the analyst, the analyst has the viewer's transcript, and he compares it to the two possible targets. If he gets a really good match to the up, remember, one target's associated with up, the other target's associated with down. He gets a really good match with up, and so the prediction would be up, and now that association allows you to wager if you wish to. So that's associative remote viewing. So I'm just thinking, again, for people who are completely right. new to this, what you're <laughs> teaching people is an intuition technology. Right. So to tap into information that they will see at a time in the future, it doesn't even have to have been determined yet what that information will be, but you are giving somebody a task right. to tap into you know, the, the winning score of the Super Bowl. Or it, not something like the actual score, but over under. In fact, over we under. did. We yes. did over under yes. on the Super Bowl got a hit. Okay. okay. Absolutely. So basically, you're teaching people to tap into information and you're associating a photograph of something with a particular outcome over under. And it doesn't even matter what those photographs are, just for people listening. It doesn't. You don't have to know, you don't have to have had them selected yet. And you're telling people to get into a quiet space and write down and sketch whatever they notice basically coming across that quiet screen of their minds with the intention to tune into whatever photo is representative of the outcome that will happen, the outcome of interest. To tune will, into the feedback target. Right. That they're going to see in the future. Correct. And, you know, just when, when, when my husband and I went to the Applied Precognition Project um, conference many years ago now in Henderson, Nevada, there was all kinds of wagering. I want wow. you to know I'm not a gambler, so I know nothing about this. I still have a hard time understanding over under. <laughs> I'll admit it. Um, but. It was uncanny how when you said, okay, take a few moments, tune into the photograph that I am going to show you, at, you know, in 20 minutes, that's going to be associated. You know, you're going to show us two photographs. One will be associated with this outcome. One will be associated with that outcome. And we sketched whatever came to mind. And then you pulled photographs to represent each outcome. They don't have to be anything like that outcome. And you had us score and see which photograph our seemingly random sketches and notes were closest to. And then we bet money on that outcome. We and there's, I'm having such a hard time explaining this, but my husband who did not want to go do this sketched and, and using clay modeled this very clear train that I never associated almost, you two with that. That uh, was great. Okay. Which was nearly identical to the photograph that you showed us after that you didn't even yeah. select till after we were done. That was associated with the um 
the, the winning outcome, I guess. Okay, so I just wanted to take a few minutes to clarify what Marty and I are talking about. And what we're referring to is that even somebody very new to remote viewing can come up with an uncannily accurate session. So my husband did not want to go to this Applied Precognition conference in Henderson, Nevada. At the conference, you hear great speakers, but you also have multiple opportunities to practice associative remote viewing. And the way we did that was to be tasked with viewing whether an upcoming sporting event, one that we would find out the score of that night, a scheduled sporting event, in this case baseball, whether the combined scores of the two teams would be over or under a certain amount. So in this case, I'm going to just say, for example, say, say it was 10. So outcome A would be over 10 for the combined score of the game, and outcome B would be under 10 for the combined score of the game. So again, the tasking is just to find out whether the score that we would know about in, say, five, six hours would be over or under that number. So the procedure for this is to sit down, clear the mind for a minute, and take five or ten minutes to just notice what you notice and sketch, draw, write down descriptors of what you observe with any and all of your senses, what you smell, see, hear, feel, and so forth. When the viewing is done, then Marty selected two manila envelopes from a pile of, say, 30 or more just randomly shuffled on a table. All of them were sealed. And he pulled an envelope that contained a photograph that would represent outcome A, say over 10 for the combined score of the game. And then he pulled another envelope that would represent outcome B. So a combined score of the game, say less than 10. And what he said is, when the game is over, I am going to show you the photo that is linked to the correct outcome, the outcome that actually happens. So he opened both envelopes and showed us the picture that would represent A, the over, and the photo that would show us outcome B, under. And it was uncanny because what Jason drew looked very clearly like an old-fashioned locomotive train coming right at the viewer, curvy tracks. There was this round, black, circular element on the front of the train There was this kind of metallic apron on the front of the train and this stack on the top of the engine. It was uncanny because Photosite A turned out to be uh, two monkeys, two small monkeys huddled together. And when Marty revealed Photo B, it was very clearly a picture of an old-fashioned locomotive coming right at the person looking at the piece of paper. Jason had gotten details. So accurate. It was so specific. I encourage you, if you get a chance, go over to the YouTube version of this podcast. And even if you just fast forward to the big reveal, you can see what I'm talking about. There was no mistaking that his drawing uncannily resembled outcome B. And actually, that's what we wound up wagering on that evening. So That's just to illustrate that somebody who was new to remote viewing and honestly did not even want to be there, totally wasn't even going to show up for this practice, can be extraordinarily accurate. Now back to the show. The winning outcome, I guess. Right. I'm not explaining this well. I might have to do a little voiceover for that. But, you know, that was more persuasive to him than anything I could have said about my own experience. Right. Um, And the reason I'm saying all of this now is not only to explain it, but because until people do it, they don't get it as well. So when people, you know, go online, I believe there's a free and a a paid membership for Applied Precognition Project. Mm -hmm. And and the paid membership is really nominal anyway. It's like $65 for the year. And it's it's $65 a year. Yeah, which is all kinds of extra benefits. But you're not even going to notice that Mm -hmm. 65. You're going to spend more on that on coffee this year. Mm-hmm. Um, but people can practice doing this because tell me if, is this correct? That anybody can strengthen their intuition. Anyone can learn to do this. Absolutely. This is a natural talent. And if you do it five days a week and look at your feedback, 
it becomes simpler. You learn things about how your consciousness communicates with you and you get better at it. Now, I should add one other thing. We've talked about associative remote viewing. I want to talk about GARV. Before I get there, I want to motivate why we went there. ARV works. We had results, one out of a million. Others have done things like that. One out of a million that our results could have been chance. But our hit rate on 50-50 probabilities, and that's what we like to work on. We've done others. We predicted the um, um, Kentucky Derby one year. We had to have 20 possibilities, and that was very hard. (laughs) But nevertheless, I'm digressing. It's it's so much. But what we found was people were getting 60 65% 65% hit rates on a 50 50 probability. Now that's that's really good. But a fellow in Great Britain blanked on his name now. He came up with this group idea and he was getting 80%. Now the elements of that which were different is the viewers did not see both photos. They didn't do self-judging. The 60 and 65 percent, even with the really good viewers, um, came because they would describe both pictures from seeing them when they did their own judging or someone else judged it. The two pictures were very much connected and entangled. You give that up. And then the other thing you give up is you don't let the viewers wager. And some of my people have left because they wanted the wagering. But if you think about it, seeing both pictures adds stress to the system. Which one is it? That's gone. You take out the wagering. That's gone. And now all a viewer has to do is get quiet, take a six-digit coordinate, which is given to them in an email. So there's a tasking. We have five different groups. Um, there's a tasking with the six digits. Their job is to generate a transcript. They send it off to me. I'm the judge now. I do look at the two pictures. I work, you know, and maybe some people read my mind, but there's been very little of that now. Um, And then based on kind of a consensus or one or two really good ones, I will make a prediction and then keep track of it. Um, and I wagering trivial amounts, so money is not an issue anywhere along the line. So those two things, and last month I got seventy nine percent. I haven't quite hit the eighty percent that he did, but I'm I'm pretty sure I will. So, do you think, Marty? Are you saying that with group associative remote viewing, it, it, there is a group effect that is more more accurate? And or more focused than when somebody does it themselves. And you've named some reasons um, that, you know, there's not the stress on the system of having to judge your own. You know, we get caught up in our heads when we're trying to decide which picture our results most mm-hmm. resemble and then make a prediction based on that. Or when we have money and, you know, that we want to wager on something. What Are you saying that there's both a group effect and because we're not as personally invested in the outcome in a way at least not by wagering it's almost like it gets some of the noise out of the way and we can be more accurate or that the group result is more accurate see the group result and i've been asked this and i really do not know the answer whether or not there's more power in a group than a single individual the power in the group in group arv is a person who might have done real well yesterday doesn't have to do real well today if there's another person that gets a really high score. I mean, I've got a transcript here that that we we judge them on what's called a TAR, Russell TARC scale of zero to seven, and it was a six, but that person may only get a two on each of them the next day, but somebody else will get a six, I'll go with the six. So it just gives me more of a chance to get matches. Also, often we'll get two or three people 
who go in the same direction. That makes me feel really good as well. But I don't wager a lot of money because guess what? That'll put stress on me <laughs> and on the tasker. And that then will put stress on the whole system. So I really do think it's all about stress. So I, I, I did this later in time. I wasn't on live, um, but in one of your recent talks, you had, this goes back to your, it's, it's the group, but it's also right. the remote influencing. And you had the group, um, you know, you randomly selected that the group's task was to influence a roulette wheel to, for the white ball to drop on a red slot. Right. And you had us do um, a meditation to go more deeply and get out of our own way, kind of clear the mental clutter. And you had people in their own ways, and you described yours, really focus on the experience of that white ball going into a red slot. Now you do this and there's actual live roulette going on that you can then, um, right. what would you even say? I don't wager. even know how to describe it. Wager. wager on. Okay. Bet. Okay. So what, you know, and I did it too, not yet seeing the outcome as I was playing the video and I'm thinking I'm swimming in red. It feels wonderful <laughs> to be in red. You know, all these different ways of, you know, white ball bouncing on a red sea kind of like, but what I thought was so interesting is I don't know how big the group of people was, but it was a group. The the next, I think, four or five spins were all red. And in fact, two in a row were 21 red, which seems uncanny. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is live. I mean, you're you're looking through a webcam, but you can see that the the, the dealer is spinning the wheel right then. Hard not to think there might be some sort of group effect, some sort of influence there. Yeah, I know. And that one was probably a hit and a few more were hits. I did that, was. For, but I did that for maybe a month or two. And the average was about 65%. I got misses too. And again, if you think about it, I was allowing people, so this was just like you said, live, I gave them the URL so they could wager, but they were, they were invested in it. And I, I gave it up. Now, that doesn't mean if I were to stay with it or other people were to stay with it, they couldn't make it work. But, you know, an individual person doing it and wagering on it, I think there's just a stress element there. Now, in group ARV, the viewer has no stress. I still have a little, but I'm wagering so little that I don't have any stress. And um, I've been getting up to, I haven't quite hit 80% yet, 79%. Uh, this month, it looks like it'll be about the same. So there's something to this, but now the purpose of this, and this is so critical, the purpose of doing it this way is the viewers learn about their own consciousness. The viewers learn that they can gather information from the future. Wow, you can do what? Well, if I can do that, I, I can do healing. And those are the two things which I'm doing now, the healing and GARV. And that's it. I'll focus on just those two things in terms of what I, you know, what I do on a daily basis. But the precognition is a way of getting training for projecting into the future. And anybody can do that. Anybody, anybody can, can tap that. into the future. They can, yeah. So Marty, I want to be mindful of your time. I have Two more questions, but I, I'm going to stay with the one just in case. No, I've got the time. Go Are ahead. Sure? Two. Yeah. You know, I know that you have experience prior to all of this. Um, stock market predictions, other predictions. What's something that you thought, wow, this blew my mind? Yeah. I mean, 65% is ridiculous. People would love to get that kind of, and that that began to blow my mind. So after a while, um, you have a negative effect come into play. And the 65% that I told you about with a bunch of people, they would get something called displacement, where they get a real good description of the other target that they don't even see. But see, they did see it when they did self-judging. It's almost like, okay, enough of this. Um, that was one of the reasons I gave it up. The 65% is, 
didn't last forever. It lasted for a very long time, as I said. Okay. We also did, I just told you about a horse race. We do roulette. I'm now doing Garv on roulette. Even before you were doing what you were doing now, I remember Russell yeah. Targ talking about um, wagering on the stock market years ago. It might be like 20 something years ago. And I didn't right. know if you were one of the people doing that with him um, or on your own. I'm, I'm wondering what is something, maybe more broadly, what is something that blew your mind, even though you've been interested in all this for a long time, where you were like, holy Toledo. Like, okay, let, me give like you, wow. let me give you two things. The first thing was a session I did. And for the very first time, I smelt salt. It was like salt, like salt water. And then the picture turned out to be, and, and I drew some other things like a, 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 um, a, a narrow triangle. And it was a picture of um, a tower next to the ocean. And I smelled salt. I, oh, <laughs> smelling, you know, usually it's visual. That blew my mind. The other thing was Russ Targ, and it made it to the New York Times. He got nine hits in a row, made a lot of money for investors, which were with him. He did it a second time, and he lost. Now, the first time was a mind blower. The second time was a wake-up call. It doesn't seem to be, in fact, as soon as you think you understand it <laughs> and you can make money on it, it tends to go away. That's like people always say, well, if psychic, if psychics are really a real thing, then why isn't every psychic a multimillionaire or winning the lotto all the time? And a lot of people don't get that there's probably some sort of higher purpose to all of this. And we're not supposed to just do this to enrich ourselves. I, I, I hate to say I it, know. but uh, no, I hate to say it, but I, I think there's a lot to that unless you can do it in a totally unattached fashion. And I am working on that. Uh, right now I'm betting so low, it doesn't matter. Um, but maybe as time goes on, I'll increase it a little bit at a time. So I still don't care. And I don't know how high that'll get until I start caring. <laughs> but right now, you know, right now, there's not enough to matter. And as I say, I really like, and I'm getting just such good positive feedback about having people learn about their own consciousness, learn how to do remote viewing better. Because notice now, person comes, does a remote viewing session, does his feedback. Nothing could be simpler. They don't do any judging. So they're just doing remote viewing of what they'll see in the future. And underlying all that, and the thing I should have asked you earlier on, but you talk about consciousness being fundamental, not only fun on all yes. caps, but fundamental, is that everything arises from consciousness rather than matter generating consciousness. And if you can't, it, it, I'm sorry, you're no, exactly no, right. And that comes from, it turns out that leaders in quantum mechanics we're forced to conclude that because an outcome didn't occur until it was measured, until it became consciously available. Prior to that, it could have been either one. Um, and so they concluded that, Planck and Schrodinger. But it goes back further than that. I, I found things going back to the Greeks. Something special about consciousness. You know, it's for sure. Your conscious moment now, right now, that you're experiencing can't be doubted. We did two webinar workshops a year. Okay, so virtual and, workshop. And um, yes, there's virtual Zoom. conference. And at the top is consciousness is fundamental. <laughs> this is May 17th to 19th. And we have these great speakers. I'm sure most of you have heard of Rupert Sheldrake. Absolutely. And Dean Radin. Yes. They're both our speakers. We also have Tom McNair who was trained by Ego, the first one to be trained by Ego, Ingo Swan. And then Dobbs and Craigs did things on Mars. This is a follow-up to something they did before um, where they'll talk about the pyramid, life on Mars. There's a lot of evidence that millions of years ago there was life on Mars. And then Pamela Osley, who um, I think is a psychologist type. Plus, we do GARV. So if you come to our workshop, you will do GARV. And to get there, if you go to our website, you can click on the banner register and, and register for it. That's probably the main thing. But on our website, we have all kinds of tabs. One is free past webinars. And um, I just I do one free one every month 
and we've done one on holistic healing. We've done one on garb. Um, in fact, those are ones that you may be seeing. And then we also have paid ones that are for the people who um, do the full paid membership. Yeah, which again is pretty nominal. People get a lot of great things and access right. to great talks and more um, for less than the price of a cup of coffee by far. Well, that's okay. right. But if they just want to do it for free, hey, just experiment. Absolutely. Um, we, we're all about education. That's all we care about. Educating right. people about consciousness. We will, And it will all come. More and more people are doing this. In the last 20 years since I've been doing this, we can just see more and more people are doing it. And eventually this is going, is going to end off in a paradigm shift. It really will. Yeah, definitely. Marty, thank you so much. I really appreciate your taking the time to speak with me and, and share your information, what you've been up to, and all this good stuff about healing. Um, I will make sure that I put everything in the show notes. Um, but again, I just want to say thank you so much. Great. And thank you for allowing me to, sh to share and educate people on this. And um, this was fun. You certainly asked <laughs> good questions. <laughs> Thanks, Marty. So this has been another episode of Unpacking Possibility. If you like the show, please remember to like, share, and follow. And as always, until next time, be well. Mm -hmm.